was worried that they wouldn't be able to defend against drones in the short term. Well, there's tr there's truth to that. I mean, it, the vulnerability of it was, uh, I think that was the most unnerving part of it because here's what you know is that once you show yourself once vulnerable, uh, that whoever perpetrated it, and again, we don't, we don't know. It's interesting, you know, and I'll, and I will advise everybody in this room and I always advise people, those who know, don't say, and those who say don't know. Oh, now it was a cruise missile, Ezra? Here, this is what U.S. just confirmed it was a cruise missile now. Yeah, okay. I thought we were, uh, well, Russia has cruise missile, man. Okay, so again, uh, and uh, I thought the president was very irresponsible talking about locked and ready, and, you know, if you don't have, if you don't know where you're going, it's best not, best not to say anything until you have a sense of of what's going to happen. So uh, that's all. But as I warned in my blog, there's, there, everybody's an expert because the media has to roll out experts. People, you know, they have to fill their time, and then you find those who are there to, of course, spin a spin a narrative. And if they're a good enough source for quote unquote journalists. They'll let them spin that narrative because they need them at other times. So they go in and they invite them on. That's why the airwaves are filled with, with, with you know, one comment after another. Uh, caution was certainly uh, the watchword. Um, so, uh, and that proved uh, very prescient. Of course, you know, the bigger story was the repo market. <laughs> Uh, which was interesting. Most people, we yes. haven't seen the, the Fed do repos. Uh, you know, I go back years and years, uh, 30, 35 years, when Fed uh, procedure was standard practice. In fact, I used to keep a sign in my desk drawer on the floor. It was a Miller highlight. It's Miller time. So at 1030 every morning, the Fed would either do match sales, uh, re system repos, reverse repos, um, and the short-term interest rate markets, uh, meaning when I first started the T-bills and um, <laughs> even certificates of deposits, and then, of course, it all folded up into the euro-dollar market, we, there would be, you know, sometimes very volatile because if the Fed did things that the market wasn't expecting, there would be movement in the uh, short-term interest rates market. So, so I, I, I was just asking about that. Um, I mm -hmm. think talking a little bit about it, telling the guys in, in our group how we couldn't take breaks as a clerk until after Fed time. That's what we call it, mm -hmm. Fed time. Right, Fed time. 1040, you know, 1040, 1042 would come out, we'd be busy, then we'd leave. But so um, uh, I haven't had time to really dig into it. What, what, what was, the, um, what was the, the, the relevance or the importance of, of what went on with the Fed and the repo market yesterday? Or was it yesterday and today, right? Yeah, my daughter is actually, her article, uh, I'm proud to say, got picked up uh, the most. It was the most read article in Bloomberg. So she's been all over this. Um, and her and I, uh, unfortunately, she, I, I need her to educate me somewhat on, on some, I mean, yeah, I know that I've been dealing with the plumbing, but some of it is new. So there was a shortage of funds. Now, what was the shortage of funds in the, in the overnight market due to? You know, that's what was perplexing people. Was it because that the treasury has been stuffing so many T-bills down people's throats that the dealers didn't have enough room and that their books were filled? Uh, was it because of uh, September 15th corporate tax payments? Uh, was it because uh, you're not getting as much foreign uh, action? What was that funny? Or because of the regulations and, you know, you have to hold on to more uh, high-quality liquid assets, and that was forcing people uh, to search for uh, especially more cash. So they were backing off, and, the, you know, the repo rates shot higher because uh, a lot of dealers said, well, you know, our books are full. We can't do any more here. No matter, you know, we just can't do any more. We're, we're at our limit, and, you know, they have margin and uh, capital requirements too. So they don't know. I'm giving you the long, there are a lot of people out there trying to understand, you know, but the bottom line is the Fed really doesn't know. So today, 
they knew they had a shortage. The shortage was supportedly, purportedly $50 billion. So the Fed offered $75 billion into the repo market to get the rate back down to 225 which they appeared to be successful at. I can't say that definitively, but everything I've read up to this point says that they're, they've been successful with that. Now, what's the impact? You know, the interesting thing is uh, a lot of assets should have broken yesterday in response to the higher, you know, because, again, unless there was a banking crisis, which there wasn't because that's the only thing that could make those rates jump is if people started, you know, um, dumping some things and searching for other things so there would be a lot of activity in the repo market in order to make sure that they didn't get caught off with collateral. So, but that was that doesn't seem to be the case because bank stocks, as we know, have done fairly well. So there was no fear. And it, and basically the, the TED spread, it was not uh, driven to the TED spread. So it was a funding issue. But it's but the bottom line is the Fed, the Fed doesn't really understand yet what's going on here. And this is of course, you know, with QT being over quantitative tightening, having ended already. Uh, so we don't know. But, but the bigger issue is, and I know this is what Judd uh, emailed me about, will it affect the FOMC meeting? I'm going to give you, I don't know. Because, you know, I thought that the oil situation would impact the Fed meeting because, again, uh, this is now another risk and uh, certainly a high level of uncertainty. And, if, you know, people stupidly talk about the inflationary impact from this. Sorry, that may play out over time, but it's it's one thing I agree with in Fed minutes and in Fed comments about transitory. And it'll be a good question. <clears throat> you can bet that Powell will get that at his news conference tomorrow afternoon. Do you view these as transitory? And I'll t I'll tell you his first response. It'll surprise me if he doesn't say is they believe it to be transitory. So there's no reason not to. Like, it, now, can they have more impact on a global basis? Uh, you know, because don't forget the, the global economies right now, as you know, the Fed and every other central bank has discussed, uh, is somewhat fragile. So could it take a huge lift in oil prices? My response to you is no, especially because of so much debt already on the books of uh, emerging markets in other countries. Because uh, uh, most emerging markets would get, uh, it would be a terrible thing for them to have to incur su sustained, and I stress that word, sustained higher energy prices. Because they import a lot of oil to, to keep their economies going. So that would be a real hit to them. So my my response is that the threat is far greater to a negative impact and i'm not talking about like 1973 these people throw this stuff out ridiculous the world is such a different place <laughs> so i find it ridiculous yeah we can go back and do all these measurements you know oh so, you know even uh, guys that respect say well at 80 dollars uh this is where it impacts I can't say that. First of all, because we're at zero interest rates. So there's no, really no latitude from the central banks. And you could do all the QE you want. That's not going to make a difference. And that was my point about watching the gold market here and being, being very careful. Because I wanted to, you know, you know and, and, and there was a, a very interesting response from Trader One on, my, on the blog who said, hey, you always warn, do not get trapped by buying gold on a geopolitical event. And he asked me that question before I wrote the blog, but that's where my mind, I was traveling back from my, sorry, Matt, we got cut off in uh, New Mexico and I nothing I could do about it. No, that's okay. Uh, I, um, I didn't see your email until yeah, later. Yeah, so, you know, you know, my stance is always, you can trade it as a quick trade on a geopolitical, and that's all it was. But I want to see the way now that gold sustains itself, regardless of what the Fed does. I think that's very important. I think tomorrow afternoon, if the Fed, let's say, does nothing, which now, you know, some of that uh, thought process is creeping back into the into the market, that the Fed will do nothing, especially with oil down. But this is a geopolitical event. 
But not all geopolitical events are created equal. And that doesn't mean that I'm running out to buy gold on it. I'm not saying that. But we we saw the sell-off, and it was interesting where the gold stopped last night. I'm talking about these at 1,500. I'm sorry, I, my wish orders were down below, below that. I thought we'd go and test that. If the market broke, we'd test that 1,495 area. Uh, so I didn't get filled last night. And I, well, as I watched this climb back, and then, you know, it's not really doing anything here. It's hanging. But I'm more interested because now you're at zero rates. Central banks have nowhere to go. And whoever was behind this attack, whoever was, um, this is not going to be a one-off event because now you've realized the vulnerability. The first response yesterday was from Putin, and we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, Putin said, uh, well, we'll sell you yeah. our, uh, That's our... Yeah, yeah, so he is. And the, and the Saudis and Russians don't forget have been meeting. And last week, Netanyahu was in Russia, for was in Moscow for six hours. So, again, you know, and Matt, uh, you know, we've talked about RSX, which has had... I don't like where it stopped yesterday. Judge, you did nice work on that chart, but that uh, 2406 to 12 area, uh, there was a gap there. I, I need to see it jump over that or, or close over that one day. But I still, I still like it because just in case anybody worried before or thought about it before, Russia's role has been elevated yet again because nothing is going to take place in the Mideast without going through Moscow. Because in the language of the, uh, of, of the um, empty heads uh, about disruptions, this and there is no greater disruptor to the situation in the Mideast and Russia. And there's nobody who can, who can calm it. That's why I, I just don't understand. These sanctions don't work anyway. In fact, the effect of sanctions, if you want to go back and look at Cuba, yes, I know they've impacted Iran. But when you deal with totalitarian governments, when you deal with sanctions, sanctions only harden them. Yes, what's the breaking point? Hell, I don't know. But Cuba was supposed to be broken, you know, 60 years ago, you know, or uh, 61, 58 years ago. And they've endured. Um, so, you know, you want to bring Putin in, into this mix, you're going to, you know, and which was my whole point of wanting to own RSX because we watched it go up even as oil prices were going down. That's why I didn't really care about yesterday's action. And it was a spike too. I mean, it was a big, big spike and yep. it needed to come back. So you've got the back and fill. It's done. Right. Right. <clears throat> right. So, I mean, it's it, a, uh, but but this elevates Russia now. He, if he needed to be elevated, he's elevated more. And because he's he's the linchpin. Nobody, you know, he could bring the Iranians to the table in a minute uh, because the Iranians need him. Because if he disrupts Syria, the Iranians are in severe trouble, and Hezbollah, who's their proxy, is in severe trouble. So we, we've seen this. We've seen this, and uh, and he benefited. He came out better over the weekend than anybody else in the world. He's better because oil prices went up, but it really delineates the significance of it. And the fact that he showed up yesterday offering a weapon system, I found very, very, very interesting. Um, and again, I thought the oil market was vulnerable only because, you know, we had closed week on the Bolton uh, resignation or firing, whatever, whoever you want to believe, because a lot of... Uh, um, so-called uh, people who were dovish, uh, be, you know, said, well, you know, there must be movement towards towards discussion between the U.S. and Iran. If Bolton, if he resigned, then he was resigning in protest of that. So, you know, people had actually, you know, we had a nice early week rally in the oil and then it closed lower. Um, but again, we don't know who's responsible for this. And, you know, they point their fingers here. Maybe it was the Saudis. You know, here, I'll say a stupid thing like anybody else. Maybe it was the Saudis themselves. Maybe they maybe they had a sense that the United States was going to start really negotiating with the Iranians. And they didn't want, you know, that's as stupid a comment as anybody else. Because, again, you don't know. 
you don't know, but it, God, the airwaves are full. They roll out ex-defense people. You know, this guy, they, you put a put a general in front of his name or a colonel or, you know, everybody. If they, You know what? Uh, I'm sorry. It, it's like dealing with economists. There's so many of them out there with so many opinions. They they, they just negate each other. I, I'm not sure, you know. Uh, again, I, you start with the premise that those who know don't say and those who say don't know. It's, that's the way I approach this. Now, they may be right, but I'm going to have to go research it because I can sit and listen to anything. Anything. And all the and all the stupid television does is trying to fill time because the worst thing they can do is go black or have somebody else beat them to the punch on something. Well, that's their greatest fear. That's their greatest fear. So they have to they have to keep going out and getting people, you know. You can get the list of who they who they're going to come up with. You you know it ahead of time. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Now you got the Canada after the expiration. Now, even with the oil down at once, God, I hate the one-dimensional analysts on the Canada. You know, I said it the other day. It's, it just Canada's so much more than oil, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, I went right to the 200-day again on the cash and backed off. Yeah, I did. I know. Right I know. I, I was watching it, and I, I was, you know what, with all the news, and I was watching the oil, and it backed me off of making that play. And, and you know what, and I... I sense that was the right play. That was one of those we dream of because it's a whole risk one. I did what, 10 pip risk? God. Those are the ones you strive for. But, you know, you do get sucked in with this. So, uh, but I I like, you know, everything you guys have been writing. I, I haven't talked to you guys since uh, Wednesday. What, Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday. Thur- morning. Thursday morning. Yeah, Thursday morning after Draghi. After Draghi. Yeah, you you were taunting the white supremacists. Well, I was taunting the white. Yeah, I almost ran over a dog. That would have hurt me. Uh, 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 that would not have been a good thing. Um, I wasn't taunting the white. I, I, we, we, I would we never do. We thought you were going to get kidnapped by a Branch Davidian sect somewhere. Oh yeah, no, no, I wasn't. I, I was. I Waco. I didn't make it to, but I, I was really impressed. I think the last conversation I was about the vast amount of windmills, and then. Uh, all the interference. I, yeah, when you when you get to uh, uh, eastern New Mexico, there ain't a whole lot there. <laughs> there ain't a whole lot there. So, no, I couldn't even get sell. But we were talking about Draghi, and you know that I think proved absolutely right on target. And what really angers me is all the people come out on Friday morning, you know, talking about how all the disagreement. Well, again. So that makes those holes. They're all lies. But here's my point with these people, and that, and I like Jens Wiedemann, and I like uh, uh, Klaus Knott. But why do they sit quiet? Why doesn't somebody stand up at the press conference and go, hey, "Mr. President, uh, I'm sorry, there was a lot more dissension." They sit there. I, the, the consensus-based organizations really are weak. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just it's a fact. They're weak. They're weak. They just, they operate in ways I yeah, boggle my mind. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I'm just looking at, you know, SPU bonds can't get below its 200 day now, and it's just sitting there. So yeah. you, you've got, you're basically just stuck here waiting for tomorrow afternoon. Well, the interest, the interesting thing is here, like with the euro, why is the, the euro has really performed again? That's something we saw too. You know, on Thursday, though, I know we were talking about it. You know, don't don't get trapped in selling the euro, because again, we talked about the possibility of the with the fiscal stimulus. You know, that people are going to realize they're underinvested in that money, and sure enough, the euro did turn uh, pretty hard from the. That was where I think we left the discussion off, but. Here today, as there's supposedly, uh, what's his name, uh, Renzo Mateo left the, uh, he, he's going to form a new party. The Spanish government is going to election. Uh, but the Italian, uh, the VTBs uh, are, are very weak and they've been weak all morning. And yet the euro is able to sustain a rally, which is interesting. Uh, well, it's really against the yen. And I yeah, thought that yeah, was a true. little risk on this morning. 
But at the same time, I, I had no incentive to even get to bother with the indices. Yeah, no, no, it's it's a very good point. It is against the yen and the euro yen, and that's one that could really correct. And I know we were talking about that too, because the euro yen has really uh, been a weak uh, uh, um, currency cross this year, and it cannot make the Japanese very happy anyway. So they're not going to be opposed to it. And you got a uh, Japanese bank uh, meeting tomorrow night. You got the Swiss on Thursday morning. Uh, I wouldn't look for any change there. Although you might get some something out of Japan about about the yield curve, you know, because they've had that the YCC the yield curve controlled on, and they're getting a little bit of nervous that they're not really able to control it anymore. We don't even know how much they're doing in QE or QQE, so uh, we might hear something from them uh, cutting back some of their purchases on the long end. Not that it matters; it doesn't. It's even they realize it's gone way beyond uh, 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 anything sensible. And yeah, it just draggy boggles my mind because he knows that this is really nothing, nothing. And again, the 20 billion was on the low end that we discussed on Wednesday before the, before the meeting that 20 would be low, 35 would probably be towards the high end. And the 10 cut, had already kind of been solidified because Jens Wiedemann had been on record saying, well, he could li- he could live with another 10 basis point cut more than he could live with QE. But uh, it evidently wasn't so well received, and even the French appeared to be opposed to it. But uh, why would you um, – you know, I, I thought Draghi made a huge mistake. He should have left it for – Christine Lagarde to do anyway, I, he, but he's he's so arrogant, you know. He looks at when I when he starts that press conference with that uh, uh, smirk uh, he, because he no he does he he smirks. Go, go watch him. It's that ugly smirk because he knows he's just lying, and, and it is again. He lied. He said it was unanimous. The shifty Italian. No, it has nothing to do with that. Stop that, <laughs> stop that nonsense. But he's 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 just a rat. I'm sorry. You know what? I have eight years of writing about him in my blog, or seven years, six years, whatever the number is. I've never been a fan. I find him. Uh, I I appreciate what he did when he when he reversed the uh, the the curve action that was taking place, and and they couldn't fund themselves even in the two year market. That was that was providing the liquidity that was needed to the system, but again, he doesn't know where to stop. He couldn't even stop himself now. Hmm. Again, because they paint themselves in the corner. He didn't want to disappoint the market. He didn't want to go out. The whole purpose of, of everything he did was because he didn't want to uh, feel a type of taper tantrum because he had painted himself into a corner, and that had he given the market nothing. You know, we had seen the uh, what the European bonds, of course, had done the previous six, seven days. The correction was enormous, and uh, but so what? Endure it, but he he couldn't take it. He couldn't go out with a taper tantrum. That's and and that will forever be. Um, uh, Bernanke will have to wear that because when he cow he really he cowered he cowered in front of the market's reaction. When he said that he was going to, uh, you know, begin uh, quantitative tightening or, or end, let me say that, it was going to cut back on um, a QE. And when the market was, you know, sent to, but big deal, he endured, but they, they don't, which shows you they have no backbone. They have no backbone. They are so terrified of the markets. They have no respect for the markets, but they are terrified of the markets. Well, and it was just such a great, you know, a great tell where the the Italians rallied to on that bond buying, and they yeah. just stopped right at the wrong number, yeah. and that's why that's when we bailed out all the metals. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Over. That's right. It, it was the perfect. Off of that. You know, Judd, that, that's it. That's a, that's right. That's a great point, and that made it all, you know, because I told you I was, you know, I was selling out. Uh, and I did on August 28th, which is the date that it really begins to take place. Uh, I, I, in fact, I was looking at my statement uh, the other day, and it's where I got out of my uh, American barrack. But 
Now, I find this interesting is that the gold stocks are up pretty strong today. And you know what's going is, you know, Mexico tried to go yesterday and it's going yeah. today. Yeah, with the oil down. So yeah, they okay. rinsed everybody yesterday in it both yep. ways. Yep. And then today it's held momentum and just ripped. Yeah, again, with the oil down, down significantly. So, you know, now the can I, I'd love to see the Canada goes higher. I don't know if it has it in it, but uh, we shall see. Uh, well, Mexico, Mexico's data uh, has gotten a little less bad. Yeah, and the rates are high. You know, so when you're scouring looking, you go, hmm, where should I go? But at least Mexico gives you a decent uh, overnight return. Uh, from the looks, Trump doesn't want to lose the U.S. Uh, US uh, USMCA. So uh, I think they'll get that through. People are, and and again, and another thing, you know, and I know that people have been. I, I didn't read the Barron's articles about the railroads, you know, but you know my my indicator has been KSU, but that's totally diverged from a weak peso. So that's kind of surprising. I mean, I'm long, and I've you know, and I've loved that stock only because I think it has a buyout potential because it's a missing piece of Warren Buffett's railroad puzzle. And I guess that's what Barron's, they didn't talk about Buffett, but they were talking about the, uh, that I guess I didn't read the article again, but somebody told me who knows, you know, what I felt about it, that KSU, Kansas Southern was uh, more of a boutique. And that may be, therefore there's a premium built into it as a takeover target because it trades at a higher multiple, which of course makes it vulnerable to any type of sell-off. Oh, well, it also has kind of come sideways right back to the averages finally. I mean, this has been up and away for two weeks since it bottomed on the uh, 28th. Uh -huh. And now it's finally come, the averages has finally caught up to the chart pattern. Yeah, well, it's usually happening, right? We get some mean reversion, so. which, is, which is good. Um, you know, you look, but I, I will say that I, this geopolitical event with Saudi Arabia, this is not a one-off event. Because, again, until we find out, and there's, you know, even, even Trump goes, well, it's the Iranians. Well, let's not be so hasty. Well, you know, I, you know, as an American citizen, I'm, I'm kind of furious. Because with all we spend on defense, you're going to show me some satellite photos, and you can't tell me within 24 hours who's responsible for an attack of this magnitude, I, I, I'm, I'm incredulous. I'm incredulous. We really don't want us to know. I, well, yeah, but there's, there's so many sources, you know. I, I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm, you know, on, on the one, and then I'll say, you know, I'm glad they don't jump to conclusions because you don't want to make the wrong mistake and, and ignite that fire. Uh, but you can't give me... You know, you're going to show me satellite photos. And I, I've studied satellite photos back in the 70s when I was working on nuclear um, disarmament stuff. And you could see back in the 70s what they could see from 7, 8, 9, 10 miles up. If not, I mean, you could read a golf ball on a golf course. I, I would look at those pictures and I would go, huh? Wow, you know, that was kind of scary. Uh, and now it's, you know, it's 40-year-old technology, 45-year-old technology. Um, and it's well advanced to that. You know, help me here. <laughs> I, I, I find it very uh, discomforting. Or, or again, yeah, you know what? You, they, they go, we don't want you to know because it's, it's a source that, scare, that scares us. But let, let's find out what's going on here. But believe me, this, is, this one ain't going away. This, ain't, this one... Not going away. <clears throat> okay. Where else we go? Else, guys? Got any questions? Yeah. And then Michael's asking about the Israelis. <clears throat> what do you think about that election for tomorrow or today or whatever? It's today. Yeah. Uh, well, I was waiting. I was... Look at I, I make no bones about it. I'm I'm very pro Israel for many reasons, but I was waiting for the uh, the rumor mongers to begin saying that they came from Israel because Netanyahu wanted to solidify his position, you know, and show how unstable the Mideast was. I, I honestly I was I, I'm sure we'll start to see those. 
Um, I, the elections, to, as usual, is, Israel elections are really too tough to call because they're, they're a very enlightened electorate. They, they and they vote. They, you know, their, their voting numbers are high. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of scandals underneath on all sides. You know, Gantz. So, and again. They just had an election. How, what was it, five months ago? And they went back to the polls again. So is he going to be able to build a coalition? You know, it's a, it's a problem when you do this in parliamentary governments because it's all about coalition building. It's no different in Italy. It's uh, even Germany, you know, it has, a, it has a grand coalition between the SBD and the uh, CDU. But the Israeli government can dissolve itself at any time. And if he can't increase his majority... We'll go back to an election again. So it, it, it's too hard. I, I, I can't I can't tell you. I can't know. The, and and all the polls, you know, all the American pollsters have gone over there, and all they've done been is wrong. I think for the dead wrong for the last three or four elections, they've gotten it wrong. So who am I? You know, I, I I'm not nearly as uh, as steeped in the in the numbers that they look at and the things that they do. So I I'm I have no idea. Okay. No idea. All right, so we're all going to wait for the Fed tomorrow afternoon, see what happens. I'm much more interested, Michael, on uh, on Russia. And we will hear from them. This is, you know, again, uh, let's, we'll watch the ruble, we'll watch things Russian. Because if they're, and I don't, you know, the, again, the ruble's held even with oil prices up, down. You know, you, the, the ruble was starting to rally well before oil prices started heading up. Um, everything for, for Putin is those sanctions. And yes, there, it's not that they're, they're killing them, but he would do a lot better without them. And, and Putin has a little problem, you know, he's getting some political pushback. So, so he needs some victories himself, you know, to get the economy going. And the Russian economy is, is too dependent on energy and needs to, to, um, desegregate itself from energy and become more things. And it's amazing that they don't because, again, you so much of the, of the world's hacking and things that go on in the, uh, in the tech world emanate from Russia. You know, and everywhere you look in the United States, everybody I know who has, you know, all the, all the high-frequency guys, you know, who do they hire? They hire Russian uh, uh, programmers. Oh. So many of them, you know, look at the guys who stole the stuff from Goldman, Rush. You know, so they need to, to help themselves. And Putin needs something. He, he knows he needs something because he, he is. He's getting as strong as he is as an autocrat. He's still he's still getting pushback. And in the world, it does make somewhat of a difference. Um, and he, he needs something. But again, you know, he I think he understands Trump. He needs He's just got to get them to negotiate. Uh, and I, again, if you want to resolve some of the, the tension uh, in the Mideast, you, you're not going to do it without the Russians. You're not going to do it because they could ramp up disruption at any time, at any time. Well, I, I, I don't think that there would be much of a, um, uh, uh, I, the, the response from the, from if we, if the United States responds in any way, in in this, you know, in a military way, I'm yeah. sure it's all going to be run past Putin and and approved so as to avoid uh, their their allies, uh, Iran and 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 Russia are in a in kind of an allied situation, aren't they? So you know, yeah. gotta run yeah. it by Putin and make sure we're not going to start World War Three. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that, Matt, at all. I don't think that this administration listens to anybody. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think Matt, Judd, I would disagree with that. I think they, the, you can't exist in this world by yourself. I, you know, I, yes, you can tweet by yourself, but you can't exist. You know, it's like, you know, don't forget that Trump pulled back when he, when the Iranians first started making some noise, and uh, and there was that one uh, attack, and he said we're locked and loaded, and then he pulled back right away. In fact, you know, I would argue that. Trump's biggest mistake right now is that he comes forth with this bluster and then doesn't do anything. Yes. So it, it emboldens everybody going, hey, he's a paper tiger, you know, to use, uh, to quote from Mao, he's, he's, he's a paper tiger. 
we know he's not going to respond. He's going to find every reason in the world not to. In fact, that's what, why Bolton may have left is because Bolton would have said, hey, you know, you just keep pulling back. You're you're emboldening these people. You know, they get they get more, which is why my point is that whatever happened in Saudi Arabia ain't going away. And everybody says, why can't the Saudis defend themselves? The Saudis can't fight a lick. You know, uh, most of you guys are too young, but 1991, during the first Gulf War, they they put the so they put the Saudis, the army into action. They had to go bail them out so fast because <laughs> they were totally inept, totally inept, totally inept. They wanted them to get you know their hands uh, dirty. They couldn't. They sent a uh, Saudi tank uh, a group into uh, <laughs> totally inept. And in fact, a couple of years ago, or when the second Gulf War took place, or actually the rise of ISIS, and this is important to note, what I'm going to tell you. With the rise of ISIS, ISIS was to establish the caliphate, right? That's what they established, the caliphate. Um... But you can't have a caliphate unless you control Mecca and Medina. Those are the kingpins of the Islamic world. And if there's any uh, people of the uh, uh, who are Muslims, you know, who are in this room, they can. I'd love for them to to speak to this because it's an important issue. And that's the Saudi power, as much as it is oil, but in the Muslim world, and why they have so much uh, heft in the in the in the Islamic world is because. The House of Saud controls uh, Mecca and Medina, which are, of course, the holy sites. And in fact, right after the Iranian Revolution in the 1980 or 1981, the Iranians made a play on Mecca by sending in those who were on the Hajj. They brought in weapons, and it was uh, a big shoot shoot up at the Hajj, you know, which the Saudis crushed, but. It's was it's not to be diminished, but the ISIS was actually moving towards the Iraq Saudi border after I you know when ISIS was you know busy running around Iraq and seizing territory, and eventually had to be pushed back because that's what the Saudis fear most is that that bo- that um, that border would be vulnerable to such uh, a movement, and if they got a control of Mecca and Medina, the House of Saud would fall would fall so quick. It's the key to the caliphate. Yeah, it's like the last caliphate we, we've had, of course, is the Ottoman caliphate. And the Ottoman Empire controlled, you know, all of, uh, all of um, Islamic, uh, and especially Arab lands. And with that came Mecca and Medina. And, you know, if you go back to Lawrence of Arabia, this, these are important things. So it's something that doesn't get talked about, but Put it in, put it in your cap because if you hear things about, we haven't, but that's a real vulnerability. I never knew that, Ira, and that that I never knew that, and now that's just my mind is 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 going with all kinds of connections and all kinds of things that uh, just going back to the to the formation of the House of to the form, formation of Saudi Arabia by, by by the West is you know the country itself and then the protectorate of it and why you know why 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 oh my lord that's so important and so yeah, interesting well that's 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 what they you know the house of Saud. because first of all there was a lot of revenue with that in in fact oh, yeah. the people during the ottoman empire the people who controlled it believe it or not was king hussein's family from jordan the husseinis i believe i'm pretty sure that's right and so when you know the deal was made to set up the house of Saud. Uh, with with T. E. Lawrence of Arabia, then you know that's where they they screwed uh, Israel. Now Israel was, but under the original Balfour Declaration, um, Jordan it was tra- Trans Jordan, and that was supposed to be what was given to uh, the Jews for settlement. But because the, the, and they thought they'd move the House of Hussein to Iraq. But the French, of course, got involved with in Syria and Lebanon, and things shifted again, and so they had to cut off part of the uh, original uh, Palestinian mandate and give that to, to 
to uh, King Hussein's family to set up uh, what we now know as modern-day Jordan, or back then was known as Transjordan. But this is all from the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, and these things linger. You know, this was all tried. All these states are new states. They were, they really didn't. Ex- I mean, yes, but they're all part of the Ottoman Empire. And when b- empires break up, we know hi- history tells you that very strange things happen, and this is what we're left with. But these are lingering here. And believe me, as much as the Iranians the Iranians uh, want to control um, the oil. Um, more importantly is the control for all of Islam of, of Mecca and Medina, and especially because it's a Shiite-Sunni divide. So there are a lot of things in play here, and let's find out who's really culpable and responsible here. Oh, my Lord, that's so interesting. That really, truly is, is an incredibly interesting. I, now I've got to go back and I've got to start looking at some things to read about that. I, I'm fascinated with the history of the House of Saud and how, how the way, you know, Aramco, the, the, the IPO with Aramco. So that's another thing that I guess is thrown into the mix here, too, and the price of oil. But, you know, here we are. They're getting, they're, they've been talking about the, the Aramco's IPO. For, for so long. Another important part of that that I want to back up and just say about Aramco is that I don't think not many people know what Aramco, what the word or term Aramco stems from. Yeah. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Uh, but, but let me, and I've been on this view of Aramco for a long time. When I first heard they were going to be, I don't think they could ever do an IPO because, first of all, it was the issue of where you're going to list it. Okay, so if you list it in the United States, I said you can't list it in the United States because, you know, if some large shareholder says, you know, it challenges, you know, think about somebody like Icon, of course, nobody can buy that much of it. But let's say that they, you could and some private, uh, you know, or some um, activist investors say you're not doing enough to to uh, support the the. Um, the price of oil. We want you to cut, you know, oil supplies to raise the price of oil to increase shareholder value, right? So they'll take them to court. They'll go, you know, you're not you're not acting in the shareholder interest. Well, of course you're not because it's totally a political entity. How do you, you, you know, because the politics of Saudi Arabia are different than the finances of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yes, they converge at some point, but they're totally different because sometimes the Saudi have to pump oil, okay? You, um, you guys are getting too young, but you know. But Donald Trump crows about it all the time. Oh, I get the so. You know, he was crowing about it yesterday at the press conference. Oh, you know, when I needed them to increase production, they they increased production. You know, because we needed more oil. You know, one thing I I didn't like about George uh, Bush, the the older, the first president, was in 1986, 87. When oil prices were down to ten dollars, uh, he went to Saudi Arabia to get the Saudis to cut oil production because they were killing Texas. Texas was in severe economic straits because of uh, the decline. I'm not, I'm, my timeline may be a little off, but he was vice president at the time. He was not president. And oil had dropped. Here, I'll put up a chart. I uh, not hard to to discern. I'll put up a monthly chart. Let's see. Um, Ah, I got to put up a monthly. I can tell you exactly. There it is. I'm not wrong. 1986 April, price went down to 9.75. The world was awash in oil, and he he went to Saudi Arabia. And you know, here's a guy who's who was an ex-CIA director. You know, and I, I said. I would never vote for him for that reason. I said, you know what? And then, and then he won the, you know, he won the election. But I, I thought that was really uh, ridiculous <laughs> that he went to get oil prices higher by getting him to cut because it was negatively impacting the uh, U.S. certain parts of the U.S. economy. Um, uh, not good. So. Uh, you know, there's there's history to all this, uh, but 
so it just goes back to Aramco. So should they cut production? Well, yeah, shareholders will always say it, but tell me what the politics are. Mm-hmm. So the politics, they're always going to be in conflict. Hold on one second, please. Yes? Yes, sir. What's going on? I think this this topic that we're talking about is so many different uh, uh, so many de- so many tentacles that are reaching into so many parts of the markets and and and, and politics geopolitics and also into the into the markets. Oh, I'd love to have a yeah. Well, we just had a pretty good low in oil. Last hour and uh, no, and the, okay, uh, I'm back. Okay, I'm back. Uh, you know, so again, I leave. You know, this Saudi this Saudi deal is going to play out for until, you know, and then what are they going to do when they point the finger? So if it's Iran, you know, as long as we're going to discuss this, what's going to be um, what's going to be the result? And if it's Iran. And you hit them, and you hit them hard, like you know Trump is mouthing off, and you hit them hard. Well, then they're for. They're, what do you th- let me ask? Let me put it to this room. Let's hear their opinion. What do you think the, the Iranians do? Oh, they're just going to go after us. Everybody in the Middle East. Yeah. Go after the Saudis. They're not going to sit there and, and and take that. No, no, no. And there's you know you got to look at the, take out your maps and look at your vulnerable points. Look at all the where the oil uh, traverses and gets out of the Middle East, you know, through the uh, through Turkey, right? Well, that's part of you know that's the the Bosphorus Straits. But if you right. go far, you know, first you have to get out of the uh, the the Gulf, uh, uh, and the U.S. Navy says they can keep it open. But if you look at all the other choke points, uh, Djibouti. Um, Oman, uh, Yemen, there, there's a lot of choke points there to protect. So, And Israel will come under attack, of course, from Hezbollah and Hamas. So there's a lot of things that are going to get ignited here. So that's why, you know, I, at least I give Trump credit because he downplayed it. Um, now he just needs to totally, you know, because somebody said to him, don't, go, don't be going there because until you know and until you have authority, you know, you saw how many people in Congress started, you know, making noise. But until you have that authority, you just sit tight. You ain't going anywhere. There, there, there are so many different things that, that, uh, that so many, so many different um, um, events in the last couple of weeks that, that are, that are seemingly unrelated but are all related from, from Bolton bolting from Bolton's bolting or firing or whatever the hell it was mm-hmm. to, to uh, how many years have, has, has the Arabian American oil company, otherwise known as Aramco been talking about doing their IPO and, and trying to price it and all of this stuff. And, you know, putting the arms on, on, on uh, putting the arm on, on all of the billionaires in the country to, to anchor it. And, and then all of a sudden, this whole thing blowing up right when they're finally coming to the to, to being able to do it, and all of the political uh, political ramifications as well as uh, 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 economic ramifications, and then bringing it back into Mecca and Medina. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just showing you that it's out there. You can go, you can go verify it. But it's always it will always be an issue because yes. as long you know it's. As long as those are the two most important holy sites in uh, Islam, and you see the issue between Iran, Iran and Saudi Arabia is far more than oil. I mean, mm-hmm. even under the Shah, you know, the United States was nervous about the Shah because, uh, and we go back to 1953 with Mossadegh, you know, is that Iran, you know, you know, which was a, the, the Persian Empire, and it had designs on certain things and the Shah was a very um, uh, willing uh, uh, ally because he wanted the protection of the U.S. so he wasn't searching out for for the greater but the United States was always worried about the Iranians wanting more Um, 
which is, you know, why you get the CIA involvement in uh, 53 and the coup um, and the toppling of Mossadegh, even though supposedly it wasn't as great as once they start, you know, doing some revisionist stuff in history that that plays out far differently than you think, maybe. Uh, but there's a long there's a long history of this, and the Saudis and Iranians have looked at each other, and that's that's the Sunni uh, Shiite uh, issue that has played out for a long, long time. And the fact that the Saudis had so much money and were able to uh, support the uh, madrasas around the entire Islamic world with uh, Wahhabi um, clerics, you know, so there, there's a lot here. That's what you learn when you read, because you know, I've read all, several books on the House of Saud, and I find it uh, fascinating. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's real, and you're going to you're gonna hear more about it you know this isn't and that's why the market is now you know setting itself up very complacently but there's more to this it, this cannot just be one off um, because it's not it's too big and whoever's involved with this too big too big that that, that that's a great way to, to to describe the 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 board right now complacent the market is yeah. very complacent set up complacent all across the board Except for maybe the Italian bonds. What now they're buying all U.S. Treasury. I mean, yesterday it was all yeah. it was all uh, you know the the, the yeah. Spanish and, and the gilts because that's right. all the Saudi money is. Right. And look at look at again the euro's rally. Yeah, yeah, it's just going straight up. And it, and it, even the euro Swiss. So you know that makes the point that we were talking about last week is that people are underinvested in Europe. So it doesn't take a month, doesn't take a lot, yeah. and even though the DAX is down to you know it's negligible, and again, and again all the talk is that they have finally gotten Germany to acquiesce to you know massive at least the FT has been running articles, whether or not it's true, uh, we'll pay attention more to uh, to uh, Der Spiegel and uh, other sources because it's hard to believe that the you're going to get a, 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 such a quick capitulation from Germany, even you know, even though I wouldn't argue with it. But again, then that puts to play uh, what Judd has done some really nice work on, which was the uh, DAX S&P, mm -hmm. the uh, the banking, oh, and that that's it, that, that index, the ESBZ, is the um, yeah, is the uh, your uh, is the European uh, stock. Uh, uh, bank stocks. So, you know, uh, again, and now the bank stocks, you know, they ran up, they ran up, they ran up. And I, I, some of these articles out there about value versus momentum, you know, interesting articles. Uh, I mean, they so, stopped in a good in a good place on the way up. <clears throat> yeah. And now, you know, you're coming into this Wednesday, Thursday thing where they're now right back to momentum support. So, yeah. Right, right. A lot of fascinating, a lot of fascinating uh, geopolitical and economic uh, issues, kind of, kind of converging, all, all at the same time to set up, as we talked about last week, to set the table for, for, for volatility in the fourth quarter. Um, in the next, obviously, besides the Fed meeting, Ira, uh, besides the, besides tomorrow's meeting uh, results with the Fed, what, what, what are some of the, the, the more major events? Um, or issues that you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, we got other central bank meetings. We have, the Fed is paramount now, especially after what the uh, ECB did. Do they respond to that? Uh, and we didn't talk about it, but on this uh, funding issue, with the Fed having to do a repo, is some of that internationally based? And if it's internationally based, then the vote tomorrow becomes interesting because if they prevail, if Powell can prevail and say, well, this is, you know, which, which has been the work of uh, Richard Clarida and which is why we may be rallying today in the debt markets. Because if this funding issue has foreign dimensions, which I believe it does, uh, 
then the United States, again, has a triple mandate because they had, and I don't care what, and I like Esther George. I think she's, she's at least uh, consistent and she makes very cogent arguments. Uh, I, I don't like Rosengren, you know, the two negative, the two dissenters. I don't like Rosengren because to me, he's too political. Uh, that's just my sense. I can't prove it to you, but he went from an Uber dove too quick to uh, to hawkish. And it's you know I respect you. You can change your mind. I'm a Daniel Kahneman guy, thinking fast and thinking slow. I respect people who change their mind because you're educable, rather than just carving out a position and this is my position. Come hell or high water. Um, uh, but him, not so much. You know, he, I, when I listen to his arguments, but he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't speak to what Richard Clare, the vice chair, has laid out very well about the foreign implications of the dollar. And if there is a dollar funding crisis, and if they acknowledge that it's a foreign, you know, it's an international, that there's just a shortage of dollars because of the quantitative tightening that took place and was too aggressively and they didn't understand what the re repercussions was while they were raising rates and they were out in a, in a funding crisis, then you might get a more aggressive cut tomorrow. But that's that becomes a very important variable in this. Yeah. And that's why if there's no dissents to a cut, then I'm telling you, pick up the mantle of, uh, of concern about uh, uh, the international implications of the dollar funding crisis. That's what I would say. My call. You can hold. You can hold me to that view. By the way. I, in I which case, I, in which case, we're looking at steepeners again. Oh yes, I would say so. That's a very good <laughs> question. That's a very good question. Um, you know, I don't know where the two down. Oh, she, she was supposed to send me. Hold on. I don't have anything here. Uh, 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 uh. Nope, I don't have it yet. Let's see. You're not going to see it on my charts because I don't. No, you can't. Yeah, I know. Seek, God forbid, CKG should actually upgrade their charts. Um, but yes, that's. I would say so. If you got that, and especially with if if the vote was unanimous to cut, very important. That would be probably the most dovish. Uh, sentiment uh, reading I could get because then, then it really speaks to the international implications of the uh, of the lack of then it is a, uh, a global funding crisis oh man I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight I'm going to be up reading yeah. well then then these have been worthwhile oh for sure there's just so many things I've taken tons and tons of notes I've just got a million questions that I've, that I'm going to, and that's what I, so, you know, that's what I love. And I, we've talked, we talked about this on, on Anthony's podcast and we've talked about it in here and, and you know, we've all talked about it just together. That's what I love so much about, about these conversations that we have because it's, um, I didn't have, I, I didn't have a, uh, 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 any kind of degree. You know, when I started on the trading floor, I started as a regular neighborhood kid Oh, by the way, I saw Johnny Boy the other day. I stopped and got my car washed. I thought about yeah. it. I saw Johnny yeah, Boy. Did, yeah. did you did you tell him you know me? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I got to go see him. Oh, God, that guy's funny. Anyway, yeah. I was thinking, you know, I, I when I started on the floor, I started as a runner. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a rich father, rich uncle. You know, it was just I had I worked my ass off and, and worked every job but out trades. But when I got a chance to sit and talk to you, and I got a chance to sit and talk with Judd, or I got, I'd ask questions constantly, just like I do now. And 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 these conversations, you know. And then, yeah, I, I don't pretend to, to to understand everything that you're talking about, but I do take notes and I go look them up. When I read your blog, I do take notes and I go look them up. I'm not going to make an authoritative statement in 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 uh, as a blog as a uh, as a um, a comment because I, I I enjoy reading what other guys say and I, I go look them up and I follow where that trail leads and that's what we did in the Merck Club. I'd sit down with you guys and I'd ask questions and or on the, in the pit or you know sitting around talking when the markets were quiet and we had we'd have these sorts of conversations or and, and whether they geopolitical or, or they were just technical based or fundamentally based we had these sorts of conversations so that i was able to to really take to i really got a great education and you know so i i i 
I can't thank you for what you provide, not just me, but for everybody in our rooms, in my room, in Judd's room, and and and, and experience, wisdom, and knowledge. You, you know, Anthony uh, interviewed uh, uh, Ro Powell the other day. Did you see that interview? No, I haven't seen it yet. I want to see it yet. <laughs> phenomenal. Like yeah. Phenomenal. You know, it's not that I always agree with Ro, but phenomenal. And he talks about, you know, because Anthony gets out of him. He says, well, do you keep a journal? Because you always talk about it. He says, yeah, my writings, my blog, that's my journal, uh -huh. doing these, you know, RIA TV. And that's exactly right. So when you tell me that, that it doesn't matter because I learned, that's why I really, I do better when you guys push at me and ask me questions and challenge me than I could ever do without it because it, that's, that's the purpose of this. That's the purpose of this. Um, of course, we all want to monetize it in our own way. And the monetizing of it is the ability to, to, um, to get into what the BS narrative is and to put a real narrative together that, that we can profit from because otherwise it's just gibberish. Get the hell, we may as well be on the right. Sunday morning talk shows. That's, that's not what this is about. It's to ferret out good ideas and go, well, you know, that's, that's a pretty good idea. And if I could uh, get myself to, uh, uh, you know, with Howard, we used to, it was, it's kind of rude. I, I, I apologize, you know, because, uh, but we, we, you know, I would come back to him at the end of the day and, uh, and, and we had a phrase in German, you know, mach Geld, to make money. Because if you cannot monetize, any, it's, it's gibberish. It's gibberish. It's 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 pure. It's pure nonsense. Uh, you know. Again, as I would teach my children every night at the dinner table, they would hear it from me, because we would discuss, you know, their days, and they would tell me something. I say, you know, can you back that opinion up? I said, otherwise, you know, opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. <laughs> uh, you know, but there are better opinions. You know, some people have have worked hard to form their opinion and they're enlightened opinions and they're worth listening to. Others are just, you know, don't give me what you just regurgitated off CNBC or CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. I, I don't care. You know, I'd go do some work and figure out what's actually going on. Or if you can't figure it out, challenge it, challenge it. Cause the proof of it is in the challenging. And because by challenging, you can say, well, this is kind of nonsense or wow, this really actually works, you know, yeah. and I'm, and I'm, and I'm attentive to it. And when I listened to Anthony's interview, which I did last night of uh, Ralph Paul, it was really excellent because he gets into that, you know, because he says, how do you know what you know? And, it, and it, you know, it's like people, you know, people say to me, Oh, you know, you must be retired. I said, retired. Really, I'm, I don't exaggerate when I tell you that this is a 12 to 14 hour day uh -huh. to be able to sit and talk to you about these things. Yeah, I'll read. Yeah. I'll read everything. You know, you want to read. I've read the books on the house, and you know that's what I do because I know that in the world that I'm competing, that if I want, if, in order for me to compete and and prove um, successful in the competition. I just have to prep myself and be prepared more than more than I believe anybody else is. You know, it's the same way I approached athletics. It's not like I was a God gifted talent. I wasn't, but I, I would, be, I would outwork anybody. And that's what I'll do. I'll outwork you. I have a broad base to build on and I, you know, have a good acumen for it, but it's all because of the, the effort that you put into it. And it's not easy. And guys, I know everybody wants to be handed, but I don't you, you you don't get touts on my blog. We may discuss some levels at times, but there's no touting. I don't oh you know you know, they, you know I say this is an interesting level. It's like I am angry at myself today with the Canada because it was such a um, that was like a classically good trade for me. It was a low risk entry point where you could really step in and. Uh, oh, it gave you a great spot. I mean, it, I was, it, it, it I did. I've been looking at it. With the expiration. Oh, yeah. With the expiration. Right. It, it was a perfect, perfect combination. Perfect combination. It, it, it pissed me off, you know. But that was, again, I love it with you guys and, and when I speak with others because it's the focus that I get. It's the focus that I get. Tomorrow morning I'm going to get an education from a 96-year-old man who worked on the Manhattan Project. Oh, 
He's a nuclear physicist, and he's now he's working on solar energy. So I've met him already a few times. But tomorrow morning we're having breakfast at uh, at on LaSalle at the uh, corner bakery, at like one. 150 South of Salad, 830. So I'm going to sit and talk to him. Another way for me to learn. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I might have a meeting down there at 820. Yeah, stop on in. in for coffee. <laughs> stop on in. I'll, I'll introduce you to him. He's a phenomenal guy. I'll be having breakfast with him. I'm telling you, stop in. I was, I was, he's, he's 96 years. Trust me. He's, he's just wow. an unbelievable guy. So I'll be there at, uh, let's see, what is 830. I know I have a meeting. Because I told him he wanted to do it at lunch. I said, no, Fed time, Fed time Dieter. He, he gets it. Yeah. Oh, Iros, while we're talking, uh, Robert sent you uh, a bottle of wine from Italy that I have for you. No kidding. Yeah. What a nice thing that is. Yeah. So I got to okay. remind myself to bring it to you and drop it off. Okay, I'll go to 31st and Shields and drink it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll drink. I'll drink it in the satellite. Uh, Italy. Ooh, they had a car. They had a car there for sale. I took a picture of it. It was a. It was an, like a late seventies, kind of a rose-colored uh, blue Cadillac. And I, I, I really? said, "Oh my God, who who's is that?" It was a. Uh, um, oh, that's Big Carm's car. Big, car <laughs> Big. It was Carmen Bertucci. I actually knew who he was. I, yeah. he, he died in February. Oh, no, I don't. Oof, oof my own Johnny, uh, Johnny boy. I'm sorry. I didn't know if I would have been there. <laughs> it's it's like, you know, we were laughing because the first thing I talked to Johnny, I said, you know, Jerry Considine and I would go way back. So I had a, uh, a white 1988 Baritz mm. that I had bought. Was like one of the, I bought two American cars, an 88 Baritz, and I bought a 1990 uh, Continental. Both of them, they were they were in a shop more than they were on the road. Unfortunately, yeah. not a good time for U.S. autos. I think they're much better today. But the car was white with blood red interior. I got love. And it was a convertible. Constantine, oh. used, Constantine used to see that car. He said, "I got to have that car." I said, "Jerry." <laughs> And then when I was ready to get rid of it, I said, I can't even sell it to you. It's such a, it's such a piece of crap. <laughs> I said, I know you want it, Jerry. You can't have it. It was ridiculous. It was, it was ridiculous. Beautiful looking. Oh, it was beautiful. It, really, it was so hot, you know. And it was, you know, because it was the cut down Cadillacs. They were no longer big. The Baritz was, and somebody customized it. Oh, Foley, I think that's where I bought it from, Foley. They, they couldn't wait to get rid of it, so I was able to make a good deal because... Nobody was coming. Nobody up on the North Shore was buying that car. No. <laughs> they needed me. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, that was not a, that was not a good selling car. <laughs> no, that was not selling up there. So, and when Constantine saw it, he goes, "Oh my God, I love that car." I said, "Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, that's great." You and my you and my father. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. Uh, so I mean, again, uh, maybe we'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in tomorrow morning after. But I am I am going to be with Dieter. He's a very interesting man. I don't know what he's going to be talking about. Uh, what he's whatever he's working on. Uh, Ninety six. I hope to keep me working on something. But I mean, you you what you get out of this, of course, is you know, the more you push, to, as I said, the better your questions are, the better I trade. And That's... everybody should listen to Cordelli's piece with Ralph Paul. Okay. I've, okay. Already, I've already tweeted. I already tweeted that out. And I tweeted Alex's article out too. Okay. Great. All right, guys. Thanks. Yes. All right. See Thanks you guys. so All much, right. Ira. Thank you. Okay. Well.